Good evening and welcome to Covenant Church. My name is Trent Casto, and on behalf of all of us who consider Covenant our regular church home, we want to welcome you, especially those of you who are visiting, maybe even for the first time tonight. We're really glad that you're here. At Covenant, we aim to be a loving family, dependent on the Holy Spirit, committed to the Word, growing in grace, and reaching out in mercy. And the reason we aim to be that kind of people is because of who we believe that Jesus is and what we believe that Jesus did. And so through tonight's service, we aim to help communicate that message about Jesus and what he did, particularly when he came to earth as Emmanuel, which is a Hebrew word that means God with us. Now, this service is not going to be a typical, ordinary Christmas Eve service. In fact, our first service wasn't even like this service. And uh, it's quite possible we had some technical difficulties earlier today that caused us to have to revamp everything. And it's possible that it may all melt down again. And if it does, we just ask you to be patient with us because we've, we already have been to plan F and we know it's good. So just uh, be patient. God is on the throne. In fact, as we reminded ourselves earlier today, uh, we're not here tonight to uh, try to do something for God. Uh, we're here because of what God has already done. Uh, we're not here to try to win some kind of a victory. We're here because Jesus has already won the victory and we're going to celebrate it this evening. Uh, the first part of this service will be somewhat presentational, and so we'll invite you just to sit and to watch and to listen and allow the story and the, the songs of what's going to be sung tonight to strike you again, perhaps even as for the first time. And then we'll invite you as the service goes on to join in singing. Anytime you see words on the screen, feel free to join in in the singing. But let's consider tonight what it means that Jesus is Emmanuel. Let me pray to that end. Lord, now we ask that you would help us together to remember and to consider afresh that you are God, come to be with us. Be honored and glorified in this service. We pray that nothing would hinder that, and we know that nothing will, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of its deep. A wind from God swept over the face of the waters. God said, let there be light. And there was light, and God saw that the light was good. But through the one man, Adam, sin entered into creation, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men, because all sinned. In the end, our heart was a formless void, and darkness covered the face of its depths. We have waited for a day, but there is only night for brightness, but we walk in a land of deep darkness. Emmanuel, God incarnate, let there be light. Rejoice, rejoice. 
Sing that again. Rejoice, rejoice, Emmanuel shall come to thee, O Israel.
things in silence lay, and the night was in the midst of her course. God broke through the silence with his command, let there be light, and the word let down from his royal throne, and there was light, and God saw that the light was good. The light shined in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. In him is life. And that life is the light of all people. And suddenly, there was a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and singing.
Covenant family, it is so good to see all of you here. My name is Chris Voorhees. This is my wife, Sarah, and our daughter, Shayla. Many of you may know but that the word Advent actually comes from the word coming, and Advent is a season of expectation and anticipation as we look forward and prepare to celebrate the coming of Christ in His incarnation. And also, we look ahead to His final Advent at the end of time, while he delivers the kingdom to God the Father and destroys every rule, every authority, every power. And so by lighting this candle, this Advent candle, each week we remember God's promises to Israel and also to the world. And we recognize our need for God's mercy and grace as we prepare to rejoice in the birth of Jesus, our Savior and King, who will come again. Hear from the word of the Lord from Luke 2, 8 through 15. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Through the coming of Jesus Christ, whose birth we celebrate, the Lord has comforted and he has redeemed his people. We light this final candle as we proclaim that in Christ we receive the salvation of our God. Glory to God in the highest. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and 
mercy my God and sinners reconcile Joyful love, nations rise Join the triumph of the skies With angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem Hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Hail the heavenborn Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. We say glory to the newborn king. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the ushers to make their way forward as we prepare to receive our offering this evening. And as they're making their way, let me lead us in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we are in a season of the year when we frequently hear about things like hope and joy and peace. And yet we recognize that those things can be simply platitudes because for many people they're not grounded in any sort of reality. It's simply wishful thinking and hoping that maybe God will show up to do something. And yet for those of us who are in Christ, those of us who have been born again, we know that you did show up. And so we say with the herald angels, Jesus is born in Bethlehem. And we celebrate that this evening. And we recognize that the joy that we can have, the rejoicing that we do together, and as we sing joy to the world, that is grounded in a reality. When we sing of our hope that we have. We know that this hope is an anchor for our very soul rooted in Jesus Christ. And when we speak of peace, this is real peace. This is eternal peace with God that Christ came to proclaim and secure for us. How grateful we are this evening. May this gratitude of our hearts be reflected in our giving. Lord, you've given us a gift of inestimable value in the person of your son, Jesus Christ. And we're grateful to you in his name. Amen. What child is this who lay to rest on Mary's lap? is sleeping whom angels greet with anthem sweet while shepherds watch our keeping alas he in such mean estate where ox and lamb are feeding, could Christian 
Sing this simple. What child is this? The song was written in 1865. The tune is much older, but it's familiar to each of us. The first lines of that song, though, there's this incredible juxtaposition. It begins by asking, what child is this who laid to rest on Mary's lap is sleeping, whom angels greet with anthems sweet while shepherds watch are keeping? You see, the first lines about a baby sleeping on 
his mother. Very ordinary. You can see that even in this room this evening. But then juxtaposed against that, this same baby, it we're told, is greeted by the sweet anthem of angels. And it causes us to ask, what child is this? And your answer to that question is the most important answer you will give to any question. So let's consider it this evening. Since Jesus of Nazareth walked the earth some 2,000 years ago, people have been asking the question, who is this baby who was laid in a manger, born in this out-of-the-way town in a seemingly insignificant part of the world? Some have said he was a great teacher. And of course, if you read the Bible and you read the things that he uh, said, you come away saying, wow, he had some very profound things to say. It was Jesus who taught us the golden rule, which says, so whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. It was Jesus who taught us about how we should treat the people we don't get along with, even our enemies, when he said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. A radical new approach to dealing with people who hate us. It was Jesus who warned us about the way that stuff could take hold of our souls and the things we possess could actually end up possessing us or even the things we simply desire to possess. Jesus said, take care and be on your guard against all kinds of covetousness for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That's good teaching. And yet... Many of those same people who will say that Jesus was a good teacher will also be offended by some of the things that Jesus taught. For example, Jesus was very clear about the way in which one can have a relationship with God the Father when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through me. It's a radical statement. And it excludes some people. Likewise, this same Jesus presents himself to us as the one who, at the end of the age, is going to judge all of humanity. And we're told that he's actually going to say to some people on that day, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Jesus clearly understands himself to be something more than simply a teacher. Others have read about the life of Jesus in the Bible and in the history books and they've come to the conclusion that Jesus was another first century revolutionary who sought to liberate the Jewish people from the oppression of the Romans and failed in the process like many other would-be saviors of the Jews. Jesus was a revolutionary to be sure, but Jesus was actually revolutionary in the way he was revolutionary. And that every other revolutionary is seeking to take power for themselves. Every other revolutionary is seeking to gain political advantage perhaps for themselves or even for others, but Jesus was very explicit that neither he nor his followers are seeking political power in this world. Jesus did not come to establish an earthly kingdom. He said to Pilate, the governor of his region in the day, he said, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews, but my kingdom is not from the world. Jesus did not come here to establish an earthly kingdom. Jesus came here to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. And Christians believe that he did exactly that through his first coming. He came and established the kingdom of God. Some say Jesus was a teacher. Some say Jesus was a uh, revolutionary. Others look at his miracles and think he was a maybe some kind of a prophet, a wonder worker, maybe even a magician of some sort. But who do we say that Jesus is? What child is this? For nearly 2,000 years now, 
across all of the world, more than a billion people have confessed that this, this is Christ the King. That this babe laid in a manger is the long-awaited for Messiah. The one the Jews had waited for, but not only they, he is the hope of the world. He is the king who would reign on the throne of his ancestor, David, but not just over Israel like David did. This king will rule over all the nations. And he will not simply reign for 40 years as his father, David, but he will reign forever and ever. And he will not reign with a mixture of good and bad decisions, but this king will reign with righteousness and justice for all forever. This is Christ the king. And so that raises the question then, if this is a king who's got a kingdom that's going to grow and expand until it fills all of creation and he is the king above every other king, the king to which all other kings will ultimately bow down, then we ask along with the song, why lies he in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding? What's he doing in a stable if he's the king of kings? And this is the wonder of Christmas, that in that stable, God himself had crossed the impossible gulf of our sin that separated us from him. And he set aside his heavenly glory, not simply to become a person, but a person of low estate, to become like a servant in order to serve his people, ultimately in order to save his people. This is in fulfillment of a prophecy given some seven centuries before Jesus actually showed up on the earth. The prophet Isaiah said, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel is a Hebrew word that means God with us. Truly, in Jesus, God is with us. What the scripture says is that The second person of the Trinity left behind the glories of heaven. And he did not set aside his divinity, but he added to his divinity humanity. So that he is in one person, fully God and fully man. A necessary requirement for him to be the savior of people. And we're told that this Savior came to save us from something very particular, namely to save us from our sin. The reality of sin is this. It separates. It separates people from people. It separates people from God. You know that when you lie to another person, you create a gulf between you and that person. It separates you from them. You know that when you experience anger and hatred and you hold bitterness in your heart, you know that it separates you from the person toward which you are feeling that. Well, it not only separates you from people, but your sin actually separates you from God as well. And here's the thing about our sin. While we can sin and separate ourselves from God, there's no amount of good we can do in order to make our way back to God. And all of our best efforts to do good and to be good for God and to try to earn our way back to overcome all of the wrong things we've done, actually what what happens is all of our best doing only widens the gulf between God and ourselves. You see, because to try to work your way back to God is to reject the solution that God has provided for your separation from Him. And the solution that God provided in order to reconcile you to himself, to bring you back into his family. Solutions given to us in that child born and laid in a manger. His name is Jesus. Many people believe that Christianity essentially teaches that if you follow the ways of Jesus, then when you die, God might let you into heaven. But that's not actually the message of Christianity. The message of Christianity is you cannot follow the teachings of Jesus until you experience the salvation of Jesus. You cannot walk in his ways until 
We put all of your trust in his life and his death and his resurrection for you. And what the scripture says is when you do that, you experience something that's like being born again. A new start, a new life where your heart is now no longer inclined towards running away from God and furthering the separation, but now to actually desire to run toward him. And the bridge has been established through the work of Jesus. You see, we didn't need a teacher. We needed a savior. And so what God sent us when he sent us his son was precisely that, a savior. And that leads us to that most interesting part of the song where it says, good Christian Fear, for sinners here, the silent word is pleading. By fear, it's not an invitation to be afraid. It's actually an invitation to stand in awe and wonder and amazement. That God himself, who is called the word, the eternal word of God, by whose power all of creation came into existence, that word has now enfleshed itself in a person named Jesus as a baby who cannot even speak. And yet, though he cannot speak, his very presence in the flesh pleads for us with God for mercy and grace and reconciliation. The person of Jesus is definitive proof that not only is God with us, but God is for us. He sent Jesus to be the Savior of sinners like you and me. The song continues, Nails, spears shall pierce him through, the cross be born for me, for you. As we consider the babe in a manger, we can't help but fast forward some 33 years to the end of his life. And after he'd lived this amazing life, and many people followed him and watched him do extraordinary deeds of kindness and mercy, working healing miracles and teaching like no one had ever taught before, a, a life where he blessed everyone whom he came in contact with. At the end of his life, he was pierced through his hands and feet, nailed to a Roman cross, a spear piercing his side. And we wonder, why? Why would he be pierced that way? Why would his life end that way? Why would he bear that? As the song says, for me and for you. He bore the cross for me and for you. At the cross, Jesus was dealing with the sin that separated us from God. You see, sin can't simply be forgiven. Sin is a debt that must be paid for. And at the cross, Jesus paid the debt of your sin so that it could be forgiven. The scripture says that God so loved the world that he sent his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. That is the promise for all who will believe, who will simply rest in the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. You will be reconciled to God and experience peace with him and life eternal now and forever. When you experience that, when that reality grips your heart, when you take hold of it by faith, then you will know why these next lines are there. Joy, joy for Christ is born, the babe, the son of Mary. Why the joy? Why the joy? Because through Christ we have peace with God and life with him forever in the world as it was meant to be and will always be when he comes again. If this truth has resonated with you, if you've even desired this evening, you said, I want to believe that. I, I, I want that to be true. It sounds maybe too good to be true, or, but I want it to be true. If, if that's your desire, I can tell you it's true. Many of us here have experienced this reality. And you can experience it too. First of all, you simply need to admit what the Bible says and what our own conscience tells us, and that's that we're sinners.
Emmanuel, God incarnate, who assumed this humble form. Counsel me and let my wishes to your perfect will conform. Light of life, dispel my darkness. Let your frailty strengthen me. Let your meekness give me boldness. Let your burden set me free. O Emmanuel, my Savior, let your death be life for me. Amen. Well, we're going to go out tonight, as Christians have been doing for more than 200 years, lighting candles and singing Silent Night. As we do so, the darkness reminds us of the reality of this present world. There is much darkness. There's much ignorance of God. There is much evil in the world. But as we light these candles and as the light spreads throughout the room, we are reminded that the true light has entered into the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And the light will spread throughout this room even as it will spread throughout all the earth. And our king will reign forever and ever. So as we light these candles, let's reflect on that truth even as we sing. If you are lighting the real candles this evening, uh, be sure to not turn it this way <laughs> if it's lit. And uh, let, let it come to you. All right. All right. Let's sing. Mm -hmm. 